evening, everyone, and welcome to Circle Performing Arts Alliance production of Pygmalion by George Bernard Shaw. I am Terry Marks, co-director and techni technical director of the show. My co-director, Louis Daly, has an active role in the show as a cast member. Anna Sorrentino is our stage manager. She did a lot of great things for us with costumes, props, stage set pieces, organization things. So much great things, we want to thank her as well. <coughs> Josh Christmore is running our tech table. He's doing lights and sounds for us. We want to thank him as well. Ellen and Kyle are doing a great job uh, with the ticket sales and concessions. They're doing so much great things for us. And we want to thank everyone for being a part of this. Um, I have a few, a few, uh, I have a few uh, things to say regarding uh, <laughs> the aisles. We want to keep the aisles clear as there, are, there will be actors moving on and off stage running on and off stage, some with set pieces in the dark as well, so we want to keep the aisles clear. Also, we want to get phones out, put them on f silent, vibrate, do not disturb, as again, we have sound and lights, we don't want any more, any confusion with people moving on and off stage with set pieces and things, flashing lights going on in their face. Yes. We've had so much fun putting on the show. Last weekend was a great success. We want to build on that success this weekend, and we want you guys to be a part of that. Uh, there will be a 15 minute intermission at the end of the second act. Through these double doors is the men's room. Down the hall to the right, through these same double doors is the women's room. There, as you guys saw, there's concessions out there. You know, you guys can you know, roam, roam around, move your feet some. All the proceeds are going to Circle of Hope's uh, foundation to build a window. So it's all going to a great cause. So again, sit back, relax, keep those aisles clear, silence those phones, Enjoy the show. See you after intermission. Hold your tongue. 
you may keep the change. Oh, thank you, lady. Now tell me, how you knew the young gentleman's name? Mm -hmm. uh, a day. But I heard you call him by it. Yes. Don't try to deceive me. Well, who's trying to deceive you? I called him Freddy or Charlie, same as you might if he was talking to a stranger, which would be a pleasant day. Sixpence thrown away. Ream of mine, I should spare Freddy out. <laughs> Sir, sir, is there any sign of it stopping? I'm afraid not. It started up worse than ever about two minutes ago. Oh, well, oh, if it's worse, it's a sign it's nearly over. So, cheer up, Captain, and buy a flower of a poor girl. <coughs> I'm sorry, I, I haven't any change. Oh, I can give you change, Captain. Uh, let me see. Uh, for a sovereign? I've nothing less. Oh, no. oh, do buy a flower of me, Captain. Oh, I can change half a crown, take this for a top <laughs> Now, don't be troublesome. There's a good girl. I really haven't any change. Oh, stop. Here's three happens, if that's any use to you. Thank you, sir. You be careful, girl. There's a bloke here taking down every last word you're saying. Oh, I ain't done nothing wrong by speaking to the gentleman. I'm not on the phone. You look the other. I'm so happy I never spoke to you except to ask me if I have now wrong. Be up to the
so long. Frightened people like that, how would he lock it himself? It's quite fine now, Clara. We can walk to the motor bus. But the cab! Come, come, come. Oh, it's too tiresome! Oh, oh girl, I'd not better to live without being worried and, and shivvy. How do you do it, if I may ask? Simply phonetics, the science of speech. That's my profession, also my hobby. Abby is the man who can make a living by his hobby. You can spot an Irishman or a Yorkshireman by his brogue. I can place any man within six miles. I can place him within two miles in London. Sometimes within two streets. He ought to be ashamed of himself, the unmanly coward. Uh, but uh, is there a living in that? Oh, yes, quite a bad one. This is an age of upstarts. Men start at Kentish Town with 80 pounds a year and end up in Park Lane with 100,000. They want to drop Kentish Town, but they give themselves away every time they open their mouths. Now, I can teach you Just now. mind his own business and leave a poor girl alone. Woman! Seize this detestable boo-hooing instantly, or else seek the shelter of some other place of worship. Well, I've a right to be here if I like, the same as you. A woman who utters such depressing and disgusting sounds has no right to be anywhere, no right to live. Remember that you are a human being with a soul and the divine gift of articulate speech, that your native language is the language of Shakespeare and Milton and the Bible. Don't sit there crooning like a bilious pigeon. Aww. Oh, <laughs> what a sound. <laughs> Gone. Oh. You see this creature with her curved stone English, the English that will keep her in the gutter to the end of her days. Well, sir, in six months, I could pass that girl off as a duchess at an ambassador's garden party. I could even find her a place as a lady's maid or a shop assistant, which requires better English. That's the sort of thing I do for commercial millionaires. And on the profits of it, I do genuine scientific work in phonetics, and a little as a poet on Miltonic lines. Uh, well, I myself am a student of Indian dialect. Ah, yeah. yeah. Do you know uh, Colonel Pickering, the author of spoken Sanskrit? I, I am Colonel Pickering. <laughs> Who are you? Henry Higgins, author of Higgins Universal Alphabet. I came from India to meet you. I was going to India to meet you. <laughs> Where do you live? 27A Wimpole Street, come and see me tomorrow. Oh, uh, I'm at the Carlton. Uh, come with me now, let's have a jaw over some supper. Right you are. Uh, buy a flower, sir. I'm, I'm short for my lodging. I, I really haven't any change. I'm sorry. Liar. You said you could change half a crown. Oh, you ought to be stuffed with nails, you ought. Take the whole plague of basket for six pence! She's come about. She's 
quite a common girl, sir. Or very common indeed. Oh, I know I should have sent her away, only I thought perhaps you wanted her to talk into one of your machines. Well, I hope I haven't done wrong, sir. What really is he such queer people sometimes? Not entirely sure who I should send. Sorry, sir. Please excuse me. I wasn't trying to so send quite you. all right. Uh, has been an interesting answer. Something dreadful, sir, really. Don't know how you can take an interest in it. <laughs> Let's have her up. Show her up, Mrs. Pierce. Oh, very well, sir. It's for you to say. This is rather a bit of luck. I'll show you how I make records. Well, we'll set her talking, and then I'll take it down first in Bell's physical speech, then in broad roaming, and then we'll get her on the phonograph so that you can turn her on as often as you like with the written transcript before you. This is the young woman, sir. Hi, oh, this is the girl I jotted down last night. She's no use. I've got all the records I want with the Listen Grove Lego, and I'm not going to waste another cylinder on it. Be off with you, I don't want you. Oh, don't you be saucy. You ain't heard what I come for yet. Did you turn my comment to taxi? Nonsense, girl. What do you think a gentleman like Mr Higgins cares what you came in? Ah, we are proud. Well, you ain't bothered giving lessons, not him. I ought to say so. I ain't come here for any compliment, and if my... Money's not good enough, I can go elsewhere. Good enough for what? Well, good enough for you. Now you know, don't you? I'm come to have lessons, I am, and to pay for them too, mate, you understand? Well, what do you expect me to say to you? Well, if you was a gentleman, you might ask me to sit down after paying her. Don't I tell you I'm bringing new business? Pickering, shall we ask this baggage to sit down? Oh. Shall we throw her out the window? Oh, I hope we call baggage when I've offered to pay like any lady. Uh, uh, what is it you want, my girl? Well, I, I want to be a lady in a flower shop, to never sell at the corner of Tottenham Court Road, but they won't take me unless I can talk more genteel. He said he could teach me. Well, here I am, ready to pay. I'm not asking for any favour, and he treats me as if I was dead. How can you be such a foolish, ignorant girl as to think that you could afford to pay, Mr. Higgins? Oh, well, why shouldn't I? I know what lessons cost just as well as you do, and I'm ready to pay. How much? Hmm, now you're talking. I thought you'd come off it when you saw a chance of getting back a bit of what you chucked at me last night. <laughs> you'd had a drop in, hadn't you? Sit down. Ah, well, you're going to make a compliment, darling. Sit down! Eliza, Elizabeth, Betsy and Bess, they went to the woods to get the bird's nest. They found a nest with four eggs in it. They took one apiece and left three in it. <laughs> no, no, don't, don't be silly. You mustn't speak to the gentleman like that. Well, why won't he speak sensible to me? Come back to business. How much do you propose to pay me for the lessons? Oh, I know what's right. A lady friend of mine gets French lessons from a real French gentleman mm -hmm. for 18 pence an hour. <laughs> have the face to ask you the same for teaching me in your own language as you would for French. So, I won't give you more than a shilling. Take it or leave it. Green, I consider a shilling not as a simple shilling, but as a percentage of this girl's income. It works out as fully equivalent to 60 or 70 guineas from a millionaire. A house owner. Figure it out. A millionaire has about 150 pounds a day. She earns the half crown. What have told you I owe She offers me two fifths. Of her day's income for less than two fifths. A millionaire's income for a day would be somewhere about sixty pounds. Oh, oh it's handsome, by George. It's enormous. It's the biggest offer I ever oh, had. Oh, who said anything about sixty pounds? Where am I supposed to get Hold that? your tongue. Oh, but I ain't got sixty pounds on my life. Oh, sit down, girl, and do a short toad. Nobody's gonna touch your money. Sit down. Somebody's going to touch you with a broomstick if you don't stop sniveling. Sit down. Oh. I decide to teach you I'll be worse than two fathers to you. Here. What's this for? Wipe your eyes. To wipe any part of your face that feels moist. Remember, that's your handkerchief. That's your sleep. Don't mistake the one for the other if you wish to become a lady in a shop. There's no use talking to her like that, Mr Higgins. She doesn't understand you. Besides, you're quite wrong. She doesn't do it that way at all. <laughs> Here, you give me that handkerchief. He gave it to me, not to you. Snatch. He did. I think it must be regarded as her property, Mrs. Pierce. Well, serves you right, Mr. Higgins. Higgins? I'm interested. What about the ambassador's garden party? I'll say you're the greatest teacher alive if you can make that good. 
I'll bet you all the expenses of the experiment you can't do it. And uh, I'll pay for the lessons. Oh, you're real good. Thank you, Captain. Oh, so almost irresistible. She's so deliciously low, so horribly dirty. Oh, I ain't dirty. I wash my face and hands before I come, I did. You're certainly not going to turn her head with flattery, Higgins. <laughs> turning a girl's head, and nobody does it better than Mr. Riggins. They may not always mean to. I do hope, sir, you won't be encouraging him to do anything foolish. A what of life with a series of inspired follies. The difficulty is to find them to do. Never lose a chance it doesn't come every day. I shall make the duchess of this drag or fail the gutter tonight. Oh. Yes, in six months and three, if she has a good ear and a quick tongue, I'll take her anywhere and pass her off as anything. Start today. Now, this moment, Mrs. Peer, take her away and clean her. Uh, Monkey Brown, if it won't come uh, off any other way. Is there a good fire? Uh, yes, sir, but that's not Take off all her clothes and burn them. Oh, no. Bring up quietly or somebody for new ones. Wrap her in brown paper to her come. Oh, do I know, gentlemen, you ain't to talk of such things. How oh, good girl uh, I am. We want none of the old Mrs. Grove to be here, young woman. You've got to learn to behave like a duck. Now, Mrs. Peer, take her away. No, uh, if she gives you any trouble, wallop her. No, no. Chocolates. Well, well, how do I know 
know what might be in them. I've, I've heard of girls being drugged by the like of you. <laughs> Pledge of good faith. I live one half. You eat the other. Uh, no, I don't want. Mm. 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 <laughs> you shall have boxes of them, barrels of them. You shall live on them, eh? Well, I will never eat it, or if I'm too lazy to take it out of my mouth. Listen, Eliza, I think you said you came here in a taxi. What if I do? I'd rather take a taxi as anyone else. Oh, you have, Eliza. In the future, you shall have as many taxis as you like. You shall have. You shall go up and down and round the town in a taxi every day. Think of that, Eliza. Oh, And you haven't any future to think of. No, Eliza, do as this lady does. Think of other people's futures, but never your own. Think of chocolates and taxis and gold and diamonds. No, 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 no. I don't want no, no gold and no diamonds. I'm a good girl. Now, you shall remain so, Eliza, under the care of Mrs. Pierce. You shall marry an officer in the guards, the son of a marquis who will disinherit him for marrying you, but will relent when he sees your beauty. <coughs> But I really must interfere. Mrs. Pierce is quite right. Mm -hmm. If this girl is to put herself in your hands for six months for an experiment in teaching, she must understand thoroughly what it is she's doing. How can she? She's incapable of understanding anything. What? Besides, do any of us understand what we are doing? Uh, if we did, would we ever do it? <laughs> very, very clearly, yes. But not sound sense. Miss Dewitt. <gasps> Give her her orders, that's what she wants. Eliza, you are to live here for the next six months, learning to speak beautifully like a lady in a flower shop. If you're good, and do whatever you're told, you shall sleep in a proper bedroom and have lots to eat and money to buy chocolates and take rides in taxis. If you're naughty and idle, you will sleep in the back kitchen among the black beetles and be walloped by Mr. Pierce. Oh, oh, oh. At the end of six months, you will go to Buckingham Palace, dressed beautifully, in a carriage. If the king finds out you are not a lady, you will be taken by the police to the Tower of London, where your head will be cut off as a warning for the presumptuous flower girls. If you're not found out, you shall have a present of seven and sixpence to start life with as a lady in a shop. If you refuse this offer, you will be a most ungrateful and wicked girl, and the angels will weep for you. Are you satisfied with that? Can I put it any more plainly and firmly, Mrs. Pierce? I think I'd better speak to the girl properly in private. I don't know if I can take charge of her or consent to this arrangement at all. Of course, I know you don't mean her any harm, sir, but when you get what you call all interested in people's accents, well, you don't think or care what may happen to them, or you. Come on, Eliza, come on. Yes, thank you, Mrs. Pierce. Bundle her off to come the bathroom. Come on, Eliza. What a great bully you are. I won't stay here if I don't like I won't let nobody wallet me. I was never in trouble with the police, not me. I'm a good girl, I am. I never asked. Don't ask a bad girl who don't understand him, so well, come with me. Come well, on. Well, I've had enough. Come well, on. What I'll say is right. I won't go near the king, not I'm going to my head cut off. Oh, come, Higgins. 
You know what I mean. If I'm to be in this business, I shall feel responsible for that girl. I hope it's understood that no advantage is to be taken of her position. What? <coughs> that thing? Sacred, I assure you. What should be a pupil, and teaching would be impossible unless pupils were sacred. I've taught scores of American millionaires how to speak English, the best looking women in the world. I'm seasoned. They might as well be blocks of wood. I might as well be a block of wood. <coughs> um, oh, well, is it all right, Mrs. Pierce? I just wish to trouble you with a word, if I may. Yes, yes certainly. Please. Come in. Oh, don't burn that, Mrs. Pierce. I'll keep it as a curiosity. Oh, well, handle it carefully, sir, please. I have to promise her not to burn it. Although I'd better put it in the oven for a while. Oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, well, what have you to say to me? Well, oh, am I in the way? Oh, no, no, not at all, sir, no. <laughs> Miss Higgins, will you please be very particular about what you say oh, before the... Of course, I'm always particular about what I say. Why do you say this to me? No, sir, you're not at all particular. Not when you've mislaid anything or you get a bit impatient. Oh. Now, it doesn't matter before me, but <laughs> I'm used to it. But you really must not swear uh, before the girl. I swear, I do not swear. I detest the habit. What the devil do you mean? That's what I mean, sir. You swear a great deal too much. Now, I don't like that, and you're damning, and you're blasting, and you're what the devil, who the devil, where the devil. Yes, I'm yes, not sure. Yes, from your lips, really. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a certain word I was asking not to use. The girl just used it herself because the bath was too hot. It begins with the same letter as bath. Uh, uh, mm. Now, she knows no better. She learned it at her mother's knee. But she must not hear it from your lips. Well, I cannot charge myself with ever having asked it, except perhaps a moment of extreme and justifiable excitement. Oh, only this morning, sir, you applied it to your boots, to the butter, uh, and to the brown bread. Uh, that. <laughs> Mere alliteration, natural to a poet. Mm, yes, well, whatever you choose to call it, sir, I beg you not to let the girl hear you repeat it. Oh, very well. Is that all? No. We must be very particular with this girl as to matters of personal cleanliness. Mm, yes, certainly. Quite right. Most important. I mean, not to be sloppily about her dress or untidy in leaving things about. Yes, I meant to draw your attention to that as well. Ah, uh, you see, Pickering, mm. it's these little things that matter. Take care of the pence, and the pounds shall take care of themselves, is as true of money as personal habits. <laughs> yes, sir. Then. Might I ask you not to come down to breakfast in your dressing gown? Or at any rate, not to use it as a napkin to the oh. extent that you do, sir. Oh, and if you'd be so good as not to eat everything off the same plate, and to remember not to put the porridge saucepan down on the cleaner oh, table. Oh, oh. That'd be my better example to the girl. You know, you need to have yourself a fish brain, a jam, oh, and I, 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 may do these things. I, I may do these things sometimes. In absence of mind, but surely I don't do them habitually. By the way, my dressing gown smells the most damnably of benzene. Oh, well, very well, very well. I shall wipe them in my hair in the future. <laughs> well, you, Mr. Higgins. Not at all, not at all. Uh, you're quite right. I shall be particularly careful before the girl. Is that all? No, sir. <laughs> um, might you please use one of the Japanese dresses that you got back from abroad because I really can't put her back into the old C thing. Certainly, right? anything you like. Is that all? Thank you, sir. That's all. You know, Pickering, a woman has the most extraordinary ideas about me. Here I am, a shy, diffident sort of man. I've never been able to feel really grown up and tremendous like other chaps. And yet she's firmly persuaded that I'm some sort of arbitrary, overbearing, bossy kind of person. I can't account for it. Thank you, please, sir. The trouble's beginning already. There's a dustman downstairs at Alfred Dubik who wants to see you. He says you've got his daughter here. Phew, uh, I say. And the blackguard up. Oh, very well, sir. <clears throat> he may not be a blackguard. Nonsense, of course he's a blackguard. Uh, well, whether he is or not, I'm afraid we shall have some trouble. Oh, uh, no, I think not. If there's any trouble, he shall have it with me, not I with him. And we are sure to get something interesting out of him. Uh, about the girl? No, I mean his dialect. Oh. Alfred Doolittle. Sir. <laughs> Professor Higgins. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning, Governor. Sit down. <laughs> I've come about a very serious matter, Governor. Brought up in house, no other well, sir. 
interesting. What do you want, you little? I want my daughter. It's what I want. I don't say, do you? You're her father, aren't you? You don't suppose anyone else wants her, do you? I'm glad to see you have some spark of family feeling left. She's upstairs. Take her away at once. Why? Take her away. Nah. You suppose I'm going to keep your daughter for you? No. Nah. Look here, Governor. Is this fair? Is it reasonable to take advantage of a man like this? The girl belongs to me. You got her? Where do I come in? Your daughter had the audacity to come to my house and ask me to teach her how to speak properly so she can get a, a place in a shop. This gentleman and my housekeeper have been here all the time. How dare you come here and attempt to blackmail me? No, you sit here on purpose. I am. Don't take a man off. Oh, my God. The police. Yeah. The police shall take it up with you. This is a, a, a plot to extort money by threats. Hello. I'm not so set on how. 
well as that, Jim, but what I might be open to an arrangement. You see, viewed in light of a young girl, she is a bright, handsome woman, but as a daughter, she's not worth a keep. So, uh, I guess I put it to you straight. All I'm asking is my rights as a father. And you're the last man on earth to expect me to give her away for free. But I can say that you're one of the straight sort. And uh, so, how's five pounds for you? And what's Eliza to me? <clears throat> I think you ought to know, Mr. Doolittle, that uh, Mr. Higgins' intentions are entirely honorable. Oh, of course they are. Oh, of course they are. If I thought there wasn't. I've asked to fifty. Uh, do you mean to say, Callous Rascal, that you'd sell your own daughter for fifty pounds? Well, you know, in a general way, no, I wouldn't. But to a fine gentleman like yourself, I'd do a good deal, I'd do a short deal. Have you no morals, man? I wouldn't even fall for the other Neither could you, if you was as poor as me. I don't mean any harm, governess, but. If Elias is coming in for a bit of this, why not me too? I don't know, Pickering. As a, it can be no question. As a matter of morals, it would be a positive crime to give this man a farthing. Although I feel a sort of rough justice in this case. That's right. That's what I say, Governor. A, a father's heart, as it were. Well, I know the feeling, but really, it seems hardly right that you. No, don't no, no, say that, Governor. Don't say anything. See, see. You don't understand. What am I? Governors both. I'm one of the undeserving poor. <clears throat> Think what that means to a man. <clears throat> when I go into a place and something's going on, it's always the same story. You're undeserving. You can't have it. But my needs are as great. Is the most uh, deserving widow ever got money out of six different charities in one week for the death of the same husband? I don't need less than the deserving man. I need more. I don't eat less hardy than him, and I drink a lot more. I need a bit of amusement, because I'm a thinking man. I need cheerfulness, and a song, and a band when I'm feeling low. They charge me the same for all of this as they charge the deserving man. What is middle class morality? It's just an excuse for never giving me anything. So I ask you to gentlemen, don't play that game with me. I'll be straight with you. I ain't pretending to be deserving. I'm undeserving. And I'm gonna go home being undeserving. Truth is, I like it. Now, would you two gentlemen take advantage of a man's nature to do him out of the price of his own daughter that he brought up and raised by the sweat of his own brow until she's grown up big enough to be interesting for you two gentlemen? Is five pounds too much? I'll put it to you. If you were to take this man in hand for three months, he could have a choice between a, a seat in the cabinet and a popular public in Wales. <laughs> what do you say to that, Doolittle? Oh, uh, no, thank you, Governor. Uh, I've seen all the preachers and the prime ministers, because I'm a thinking man. I'm into politics and religion, mm -hmm. social reform, the same as any other game. And I tell you, it's a dog's life, any way you look at it. No, undeserving poverty is my line. It's, uh, it's, uh, uh, the only social station in life that has any, um, any ginger in it. Oh, my way. I suppose we must give him a five, huh? He'll make a bad use of it, I'm afraid. Oh, no, don't say that, Governor. You don't have to worry that I'll waste it. Save it, put it by. There won't be a penny of it left by Monday. <laughs> oh, I'm 
go back, say this old please. It's just one good job for me and the missus. Give it a little pleasure to ourselves. Employment to others and to you the satisfaction of knowing it ain't been thrown away. The good Lord spend it better. This is irresistible. Let's give him ten. Oh, no, no, Governor. The little woman wouldn't have a heart. Ten, and perhaps I shouldn't give now ten dollars, that's a lot of money. It makes a man prove and lie to There goes that. You just give me what I ask for. I'll penny more, and I'll penny less. Why don't you marry that missus of yours? I'd rather draw the line at encouraging that sort of um, immorality. Well, you tell her that. I'm willing. It's me that suffers by it. Oh, I got no hold on it. Uh, I gotta be, make myself agreeable. I, I gotta give her things. I, I gotta buy her clothes, something sinful. Now, <laughs> I'm a slave to that woman just because I'm not her lawful husband. Now, now you, gotta, you catch her want to marry me. You take my advice, sir. You marry Eliza. Young, you don't know no better. If you wait too late, you'll be sorry. Now, she'll be sorry. Uh, but better you than she, because you're the man. She's only the woman. She don't know how to be happy anyhow. Figuring if we listen to this man any longer, we shall have no convictions left. I, I think you said uh, five pounds? Yes, right. Uh -huh. Sure you won't take ten? <clears throat> Not now. Another time, Governor. There you are. Thank you, Governor. And good morning. Excuse me. Just this week, sir. I have some business at a distance. 
but later on, you may depend on me. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ma'am.
I've got the pronunciation all right, but you must consider not only how a girl pronounces, but what she pronounces. And that's where I see. Oh, sure. young man, I 
Bet I got it right. Gilly! I am sure I hope it won't turn cold. <laughs> There's so much influenza about. Mm -hmm. It runs right through my family regularly every spring. <laughs> my aunt died of influenza. <laughs> <laughs> so they said. But it's my belief they done the old woman in. <laughs> done her in? Yes, Lord love you. Why should she die of influenza? She come through diphtheria right enough for you before. <laughs> I saw her with my own eyes. Fairly blue with it she was. They all thought she was dead, but my father, he kept ladling gin down her throat. Because <laughs> she came to so sudden that she bit the ball off the spoon. <laughs> Dear me. <laughs> yes, what call would a woman with that strength in her have to die of influenza? And what become of her new straw hat that should have come to me, hmm? Somebody pinched it. And what I say is, them is pinched it, done her in. What does doing her in mean? Oh, that's oh. the new small talk. Uh, to do someone in means to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> Surely you don't believe that your aunt was killed? Do I not? Them she lived with would have killed her for a hat pin, let alone a hat. But it can't have been right for your father to pour spirits down her throat like that. It could have killed her. Oh, not her. Jean was mother's milk to her. <laughs> Besides, he poured so much down his own throat that... He knew the good of it. <laughs> Do you mean that he drank? Drank? My word, something chronic. <laughs> How dreadful for you. Oh, it never did him no harm what I could see, but then he did not keep it up regular. On the first, as you might say, from time to time, and always more agreeable when he had a drop in. When he was out of work, my mother used to give him four pence and tell him not to come back until he drunk himself cheerful and loving life. Oh, there's lots of women have to make their husbands drunk to make them fit to live with. You see, it's like this. When a man has a bit of a conscience, it always takes him when he's sober, and then it makes him low-spirited. A drop of booze just takes that right off and makes him happy. <laughs> Here, what are you sniggering at? The new small talk. You do so awfully well. Well, if I was doing it proper, then what was you laughing at? Have I said something I oughtn't? Not at all, Miss Doolittle. Well, that's a mercy, anyhow. What I always say... <coughs> well, I I'm afraid I must be going. So pleased to have met you. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye, Colonel Pickering. Goodbye, Miss Doolittle. Goodbye, all. <laughs> Are you walking across the park, Mr. Little? If so. Walk, not bloody lightly. Oh. Ah. No. I am going in a taxi. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I really can't get used to the new ways. Oh, you're all right, Mama. Quite all right. People will think we never go anywhere or see anyone if we're so old fashioned. Well, I dare say I am very old fashioned. But I do hope you won't begin using that expression, Clara. I have grown accustomed to hearing you talk of men as rotters and calling everything filthy and beastly, which I think is horrible and unladylike. But this last is really too much. Don't you think so, Colonel Pickering? Oh, uh, don't ask me. I, I've, been, I've been away in India for several years, and uh, manners have changed so much that sometimes I don't know whether I'm at a respectable dinner table or in a ship's forecastle. Well, it's all a matter of habit. There's no right or wrong in it, or nobody means that it's by it. And it's so quaint, and gives such a smart emphasis to things that are in themselves not very witty. I find the new small talk delightful and quite innocent. After that, I think it's time for us to go. Oh, yes. <laughs> we still have three at home to go to still. Goodbye, Mrs. Higgins. Uh, goodbye, Colonel Pickering. Goodbye, Professor Higgins. Goodbye. Uh, be sure to try on the new small talk and the three at homes. Don't be nervous about it. Pitch it in strong. I will. Goodbye. Such nonsense, all this early Victorian prudery. Oh, such damn nonsense. Oh. 
problem of how to pass her off as a lady. No. Oh, problem. I've half solved it already. You two infinitely stupid male creature. <laughs> the problem of what is to be done with her afterwards. Uh, I see nothing in that. Uh, she'll be fine with all the advantages I've given her. The advantages of that poor woman who was here just now? The manners and habits that disqualify a fine lady from earning her own living without giving her a fine lady's income? Is that what you mean? Oh, uh, that will be all right, Mrs. Yes, Williams. we'll find her some live employment. Uh, she's happy enough. Uh, don't you worry about her. Uh, goodbye. <laughs> Anyhow, there's no use bothering about it now. The thing's done. Uh, there are plenty of openings. Uh, we'll do what's right. Uh, goodbye. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, let's take her down to the Shakespeare exhibition at Ellsworth. Uh, yes, let her remarks will be delicious. We'll have her mimic all the people for us when we get home. Get up! Anything wrong? Oh, nothing wrong with you! I've won your best! 
I want it. What did you throw those slippers at me for? Because I wanted to smash your face in. I'd like to kill you, you selfish brute. Why don't you just leave me where you picked me out all over the gutter? Oh, you thank God it's all over, and now you can just throw me back here again, do you? Creatures know us after all.
going on about this in the middle of the night? I only want to know what I may take with me. I don't want to be accused of stealing. Stealing? <laughs> Shouldn't have said that, Eliza. That shows a want of feeling. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm only a, a common, ignorant girl, and in my station I have to be careful. There can't be any feeling between the like of you and the like of me. Please, will you just tell me what belongs to me and what doesn't? Oh, you may take the whole damn house full if you like. Except the jewels, they're hired. Will that satisfy you? Uh, stop, please. Would you take these up to your room and hold on to them? I don't want to run the risk of their being missing. At the moment. These belong to me instead of the jewel. I'd ram them down your ungrateful throat. But this ring isn't the jeweler's. <laughs> it's the one you bought for me in Brighton. And I don't want it now. Something. 
you know any of the people? Uh, well, only her father, the fellow, the fellow we told you about. Mr. Dillon. Say here, do you say this? You've done this. Done what, man? This I tell you. Look at this hat. Look at this coat. Uh, has Eliza been buying you clothes? Eliza? <laughs> she not hat. Why would Eliza buy me clothes? Good morning, Mr. Oh. Doolittle. Would you sit down? Oh, beg your pardon, man. I have been so full of what has happened to me, I can't think of anything else. What the dickens has happened to you? It had only happened to me. Anything might happen to anybody. Nobody to blame but Providence. This is something that you've done to me. Yes, you, Henry Higgins. Uh, have you found Eliza? That's the point. She lost? Yes. Oh, you have all the luck out of you. No, I haven't found it. But she'll find me soon enough. Now, after what you've done to me. What about? But what has my son done to you, Mr. Doolittle? Ruined me? What? Destroyed my confidence, tied me up, and delivered me into the hands of middle class morality. Oh, you're brave in your mad little drunk. I gave you five pounds. After that, I had two conversations with you at half a crown an hour. Oh. I've never seen you since. Oh, man!
is what I am. What would be left for me but the workhouse? And I haven't the nerve for the workhouse in my old age. Intimidated, broke down, bored out. Happier men than me will call for my dust and touch me for a tip. And I'll look on, I will look on, and I will be able to do a thing. And that's what I've come to. Well, very glad to see you won't do anything foolish, Mr. Doolittle. For this solves the problem of Eliza's future, you can provide for her now. Oh, I'm expected to provide for everybody. Oh, 3,000 pounds a year. Uh, no, nonsense. He can't provide for her. He shan't provide for her. I pay him five pounds for her. She doesn't belong to him. Uh, do it until either you're an honest man or a rogue. A little of both, Henry. Like the rest of us, a little of both. Uh, you took the money for the girl, and you have no right to take her as well. Henry, don't be absurd. If you really want to know where Eliza is, she's upstairs. Uh, upstairs? And I shall jolly soon fetch her downstairs. Be quiet, Henry. Sit down. I... Sit down, dear, and listen to me. Oh, very well, very well. <laughs> you might show this is half an hour ago. Eliza came to me this morning, partly walking about in a rage, Partly trying to throw herself into a river and being afraid to, and partly in the Carlton Hotel. She told me of the brutal way you two treated her. Well, uh, my dear Mrs. Higgins, uh, uh, she's been telling you stories. Uh, uh, we didn't treat her brutally. Uh, we hardly said a word to her, and we parted on particularly good terms. Higgins, did you bully her after I went to bed? Oh, just the other way about. She threw my slippers in my face. She behaved in the most outrageous way. I never gave her the slightest provocation. The slippers came bang into my face the moment I entered the room. Before I had uttered a word, she used perfectly awful language. Uh, but why? What did we do to her? I think I know pretty well what you did. The girl is naturally rather affectionate, isn't she, Miss Oh, yeah, she's a very tender-hearted man. She takes after me. So, well, she had become attached to you both. She had worked very hard for you, Henry. I don't think you quite realize what anything in the nature of brain work means to a girl like that. Well, it seems that when the great day of trial came and she did this wonderful thing for you without making a single mistake, you two sat there without saying a word to her, but instead talked together of how glad you were it was all over <laughs> and how you'd become
his best, Mrs. Higgins. Henry, you don't look at all nice in that attitude. I was not trying to look nice, Mother. Doesn't matter, dear. I only wanted you to speak. Why? You can't speak and whistle at the same time. Well, where the devil is that girl? Are we to wait here all night? Uh, How do you do, Professor Higgins? Are you quite well? Am I? Of course you are. You are never ill. <laughs> Colonel Pickering, so good to see you again. <laughs> quite chilly this morning, isn't it? Uh, don't you dare try this game on me. It doesn't, I taught it to you, and it doesn't take me in. Get up and come home and don't be a fool. Very nicely put, Henry. No woman could resist such an invitation. <laughs> you let her alone, Mother. Let her speak for herself. You shall jolly soon see whether she has an idea I have been put into her head or a word I have been put into her mouth. Yes. I tell you, I have created this thing out of the squashed cabbage leaves of Covent Garden, and now she pretends to play the fine lady with me. Yes, dear, but you'll sit down, won't you? Will you? Throw me out altogether now that the experiment is over, Colonel Pickering. Oh, no. You mustn't think of it as an experiment. It shocks me somehow. Oh, uh, but I'm only a squashed cabbage leaf. Oh, no. no but no. I owe so much to you that I should be very unhappy if you forgot me. Uh, it's very kind of you to say so, Miss Doolittle. And it's not because you paid for my dresses. I know you're generous to everyone with money, but it was from you that I learnt really nice manners. And that is what makes one a lady, isn't it? If you see, it was so very difficult for me with the example of Professor Higgins always before me. I was brought up to be just like him, unable to control myself, prone to swearing on the slightest provocation. And I should never have known that ladies and gentlemen didn't behave that way if, if you hadn't been there. Uh, well, that's only his way, you know. He doesn't mean it. Oh, of course. I didn't mean it when I was a flower girl, but you see, I did it. And that's what makes the difference after all. No doubt. Still, he told you to speak, and I couldn't have done that, you know. Uh, of course, that is his profession. Damnation. It was just like learning to dance in a fashionable way. There was really nothing more than that in it. But do you know what began my real education? Uh, what? It was your colony, Miss Doolittle, on that first day when I came to Wimple Street. That was the beginning of self-respect for me. And there were a hundred other little things that you never noticed because they came so naturally to you. Things about taking off your hat and opening doors and all of a sudden... Oh, uh, uh, that was nothing. Uh, uh, yes. Things that showed that you thought and felt about me as if I was something better than a scullery maid. Although I know you would have been just the same to a scullery maid if she had been in the drawing room. And you never took off your boots in the dining room when I was there. <laughs> Oh, you, you mustn't mind that. Uh, Higgins takes his boots off all over the place. Yes, of course. I'm not blaming him. It is his way, isn't it? But it made such a difference to me that you didn't do it. You see, apart from the things that anyone can pick up, the, the proper way of speaking and dressing and so on, the, the difference between a lady and a flower girl is it's not how she behaves. It's how she's treated. And I shall always be a flower girl to Professor Higgins because he's always treated me as a flower girl and always will, but I know I can be a lady to you because you've always treated me as a lady and always will. Don't grind your teeth, Henry. Well, uh, this is really very nice of you, Miss Doolittle. Um, I should like you to call me Eliza now, if you would. Uh, oh, uh, thank you. Eliza, of course. <laughs> and I should like Professor Higgins to call me Miss Doolittle. I'll see you damned first. Mm. <laughs> Henry! Henry! Why don't you slang back at him? Don't stand it. It would do him a lot of good. Oh, I can't. I could have done it once, but now I, I can't go back to it. Last night when I was wandering about, this girl came up to me, and, and I tried to get back into the old way with her, but I just couldn't do it. You told me, you know, that when a child is brought to a foreign country, it picks up the language in a few weeks and forgets its own. Well, I'm a child in your country. I've forgotten my own language and can speak nothing but yours. And that's the real break-off between the corner of Tottenham Court Road and 
Leaving Wimpole Street finishes it. Uh, but you're coming back to Wimpole Street. You'll forgive Higgins. No, forgive, will she? Well, let her go. Let's see how she can get on. She'll relax in three oh, weeks without me at her elbow. It's incorrigible, Eliza. You won't relapse, will you? Oh, no. No, I don't suppose I could ever utter one of those old sounds by Troll. Ah, just so, just so victory, victory. Can you blame the girls? Don't look at me like that, Eliza. It ain't my fault. I've come into money. You must have touched a millionaire this time, Dad. I have, but I'm dressed something special today. I'm going to St. George's, Hanover Square. Your stepmother is going to marry me. Uh, you're letting yourself down to marry that low comic woman? Uh, he ought to, Eliza. Uh, why has she changed her mind? Intimidated, Governor. Intimidated. Middle class morality claims its victim. Eliza, won't you come? Put on your hat. Go with me, see me turned off. Well, if the Colonel says I must, then. I'll demean myself for all my suffering. Oh, don't worry, Eliza. She rarely comes to words with anyone now. Respectability has struck all the spirit out of her. Uh, be kind to them, Eliza. Make the best of it. Well, just to show there's no ill feeling, I'll be back in a moment. Hey, uh, I'm feeling uncommon nervous about the ceremony today. I wish you'd come with me and see me through it. But you've been through it before, man. You were married to Eliza's mother. Who told you that? <laughs> uh, well, nobody told me, but I concluded naturally Oh, that... that ain't the natural way. That's only the middle class way. My way was always the undeserved way. But you will come with me. Uh, See me through it straight. Uh, quite right. Um, with pleasure, as far as a bachelor can. Can I call Mr. Doolittle? I should be very sorry to miss your wedding. Oh, I should be honored by your condescension, man. And the little woman would consider it a tremendous compliment. She's been very low lately, thinking about the happy days that are no more. Well, I'll get ready and order the carriage. Shall be more than 15 minutes? I'm going to the church to see your father married, Eliza. You'd better come with me in the brown. Colonel Pickering can go on with the bridegroom. Rod Green? What a work. It makes a man realize his position somehow. Before I go, Eliza, do forgive him and, uh, and come back to us. Uh, I don't suppose Papa would allow me, would you, Dad? Dad? Well, they were very cunning, them two sportsmen. See, if there'd been only one of them, uh, you could have nailed him. But you see, there was two of them, the one of them chaperoned the other, as it were. But I bear no malice, Colonel. I should have done the same myself. You know, I've been the victim of one woman after another all my life, and I don't begrudge you getting the better of Eliza. I shan't interfere. It's getting to be time. Uh, so long, Henry. See you at St. George's, Eliza. Do you stay with us, Eliza? Enough, and are you going to be reasonable or do you want any more? Oh, do you want me back only to pick up your slippers and fetch and carry for you? I haven't said I wanted you back at all. Oh, indeed. Then, hmm, what are we talking about? About you, not about me. If you come back, I shall treat you just as I have always treated you. I can't change my nature and I don't <laughs> intend to change my manners. My manners are exactly the same as Colonel Pickering's. Oh, that's not true. He treats a flower girl as if she was a duchess. Oh, and I treat a duchess as if she was a flower girl. Ah. I see. The same to everybody. Just so. Like father. <laughs> Without accepting the comparison at all points, it's quite true that your father's not a snob, and that he will feel quite at home at any station of life to which his uh, 
eccentric destiny calls him. The great secret to Lazarus, not having bad manners, but good manners, or any other particular sort of manners, but having the same manners for every human soul. In short, behaving as if you were in heaven, where there are no third class characters, and one soul is as good as another. Amen. You are a born preacher. Now, the question is not whether I treat you rudely, but whether you ever heard me treat anyone else better. I don't care how you treat me. I, I don't mind your swearing at me. I don't mind a black eye. I've had one of those before, but I won't be passed over. Well, then get out of my way, for I won't stop for you. <laughs> Talk about me as if I was a motor bus. So you are a motor bus, all bounce and go with no consideration for anyone but yourself, but I can do without you. I, Don't think I can't. I know you can. I told you you could. I know you did, you brute. You tried to get rid of me. Liar. Oh. Huh. Thank you. You never ask yourself, I suppose, whether I can do without you. Oh, don't you try to get round me. You'll have to do without me. Oh, I can do without anybody. I, I have my own soul, my own spark of divine fire, but I shall miss you, Eliza. I've learnt something from your uh, idiotic notions. I, I confess that humbly and gratefully. And I've grown accustomed to your voice and appearance. I like them, Norman. Well, you have both of them in your photographs and on your gramophone, and when you're lonely without me, you can turn the machine oh. on. It's got those feelings. I can't so. turn on your soul. It'd be those feelings and take away the voice and the face, and not you. <laughs> you can twist the heart and a girl as easy as some could twist her arm. You know, Mrs. Pierce warned me about you. Time and again, she has tried to leave you, but you always got round her at the last minute. You don't care a bit for her, and you don't care a bit for me. I care for life, for humanity, and you're a part of it that has come my way and been built into my house. What more could you or anyone else ask? I don't care for anyone that doesn't care for me. <laughs> Commercial principles, Eliza. Like sin and violence, is it? Don't sneer at me. It's me who sneer at oh, me. I've never sneered in my life. Oh. Sneering doesn't become either the human face or the human soul. I'm expressing my righteous contempt for commercialism. I don't and won't trade in affection. You call me a brute because you couldn't buy a claim on me by fetching my slippers and finding my spectacles. Well, you were a fool. I think a woman fetching a man's slippers is a disgusting sight. Did I ever fetch your slippers for you? I think a great deal more of you for throwing them in my face. No you slaving over me, and then saying you want to be cared for. Who cares for a slave? If you come back, come back for the sake of good fellowship, or you'll get nothing else. And if you dare, set up your little dog's tricks of fetching and carrying slippers, I'll slap the door in your silly face. What did you do it for if you didn't care for me? Why, because it was my job. You didn't think of the trouble it would cause me. <clears throat> Would the world have ever been made if its maker was afraid of making trouble? <laughs> making life means making trouble. The only way to escape trouble is by killing things. Cows, you notice, are always shrieking about having trouble some people kill. Well, I'm no preacher like you are. I don't notice things like that. I notice that you don't notice me. <laughs> oh, Eliza, you are an idiot. I waste the treasures of my Miltonic mind by spreading them before you. Now understand once and for all that I go my way and do my work without caring two pence what happens to either of us. I'm not intimidated like your father and stepmother. So you can come back or go to the devil, which you please. What am I to come back for? For the fun of it. That's why I took you on. Ah, yes, and then you may throw me out tomorrow if I don't do everything you want me to do. Yes, and you may go just as soon as I don't do everything you want me to do. Mm, I live with my stepmother. Yes, all sell flowers. <sighs> Only I could go back to my flower basket. I'd be rid of you and father and all the world. <laughs> why did I let you take my independence? <laughs> why did I give it up? I'm I'm a slave now for all my fine clothes. Not at all. I'll uh, adopt you as my daughter and set the money on you. Or would you rather marry Pickering? I wouldn't marry you if you asked me. You're nearer my age than what he is. Then he is, not then what he is. I'll talk as I like. You're not my teacher now. So, I don't suppose you would know. And as confirmed an old bachelor as I am. That's not what I want, and don't you think it? I've always had chaps enough wanting me that way up. Betty Hill writes to me twice and, and three times a day. Sheets and uh, sheets. Uh, no, damn his impudence. No, he has a right to if he likes the poor lad. And he does love me. And uh, you have no right to encourage him. Every girl has a right to be loved. What? Like fools like that? Freddy is not a fool. Uh, and if he's weak and poor and wanting...
wants me, maybe he'd make me happier than my betters that bully me and don't want me. Can he make anything of you? That's the point. Well, perhaps I could make something of him, but that's not what I want, and don't you think it? I only want it to be natural. Of course, Dad. <coughs> then what in thunder are we quarreling about? I want a little kindness. I know I'm a common ignorance girl, and you're a book-learned gentleman, but I am not dirt under your feet, or I, what I've done with... What I did was not for the dresses or the taxis. I did it because we were pleasant together, and I come... came to care for you. Not to want you to, to make love to me, and not forgetting the difference between us, but... More friendly, Liza. Oh, Liza, that's exactly how I feel and how Pickering feels. You're a fool. That's that's not a proper answer. Well, it's all you'll get until you stop being a common idiot. If you're going to be a lady, you'll have to give up feeling neglected. If the men you know don't spend half their time snivelling over you, and the other half giving you black eyes. You can't stand the coldness of my sort of life, or the strain of it, and go back to the gutter. Work until you're more a brute than a human being, and then cuddle and squabble and drink until you fall asleep. Oh, it's a fine life. The life of the gutter. It's real. It's warm. It's violent. You can feel it through the thickest skin. You can taste it and smell it without any work or any training. Not like science. And literature and classical music and art and philosophy. You find me cold, unfeeling, selfish, do you? Well then, be off with you to the sort of people you like. Marry some sentimental hogs or other with lots of money and a thick pair of lips to kiss you with and a thick pair of boots to kick you with. You can't appreciate what you've got, but go get what you can appreciate. You are a cruel tyrant. I can't say anything to you. You turn everything against me. I'm always in the wrong, but you know very well all this time that you are nothing but a bully. You know I can't go back to the the gutter, as you call it, and that I have no real friends in this world but you and the Colonel. You know well I couldn't bear to live with a low common man after being with you two, and it is wicked cruel of you to think that I can. <laughs> you think that I must come back to Wimple Street, because I have nowhere else to go but father's. But don't you be so sure that you have me under your feet to be trampled and talked down. <laughs> I'll marry Freddy. I will, just as soon as he's able to support me. Rubbish, you'll marry a Governor General of India or a Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. I'm not going to have my masterpiece thrown away on Freddy. Oh, you think I like you to say that, but I haven't forgot what you just said a minute ago. And I won't be coaxed around as if I was a baby or a puppy. If I can't have kindness, I have independence. Independent, middle class blasphemy. We're all dependent on one another, every soul of us. Hmm. I'll let you see whether I'm dependent on you. You can preach, I can teach. I'll go and be a teacher. What will you teach in heaven's name? Oh, what you taught me. I'll teach phonetics. <laughs> and I'll offer myself as an assistant to Professor Nepean. What? That, that imposter, that humbug, that turning ignoramus. Teach him my methods, my discoveries. You take one <laughs> step in his direction, and I'll wring your neck, you hear me? Go ahead and bring away. What do I care? I mean, you'd strike me one day. <laughs> now I know how to deal with you. Oh, you can't take away the knowledge you gave me. You said yourself I have a finer ear than you, and I can be civil and kind to people, which is more than you can. <laughs> Oh, that's done you, Henry Higgins, it has. Now, I don't care that for all your bullying and your big talk, I'll advertise at the papers that your duchess is just the flower girl that you taught, and that she'll teach anyone how to be a duchess just the same in six months for hmm, a thousand guineas. Oh, oh, and I think of myself being trampled under your feet and talked down when... All I had to do was lift up a finger to be just as good as you. <laughs> oh, I could just kick myself. Damned impudent slut. Well, it's better than snivelling. Better than fetching slippers, isn't it? By George, Eliza, I 
I said I'd make a woman of you, and I have. I <clears throat> like you this way. Mm. Yes, you make up to me when I'm no longer afraid of you and can do without uh, you. Of course, you little fool. Before, you were like a millstone around my neck. Now you're a tower of strength, a consort battleship. You and I and Pickering shall be three old battlers instead of two men and a silly girl. The coat is waiting, Eliza. Are you ready? Uh, quite. Is the professor coming? Certainly not. He'll never behave himself in church. Uh, he makes remarks all the time out loud on the clergyman for no reason. Well, then, I shall not see you again, Professor. Goodbye. By the way, Eliza, uh, order me a hammer of Stilton cheese, will you? And uh, buy me a new pair of reindeer gloves to match the new suit. At Eel and Binmins, you can choose the colour. Buy them yourself. I'm afraid you've spoiled that girl, Henry. Never mind, dear. I'll buy you the suit in time. Oh, don't bother. She'll buy them all right enough. Bye, Mother. Goodbye. <laughs>